Hello everyone, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about how writers use the words and ideas of others to advance their own writing, and talk a little bit about how you can do that in your work. To begin with just a brief review, in class we've been talking about this concept of they say, I say, using that as a way to talk about how to write. The basic concept is quite simple, that we use what others say as a launching pad for our own ideas, for our own words. We take what they say, whether they is a specific person or a, a specific group or people in general, and we respond on that subject with our ideas, what we say or what I say. So we started by using these templates or these basic formats for responding at first to general ideas, popular ideas, things that many people say, uh, or beliefs that we once held and have developed or changed. So here's a few examples of some of the general templates that we used to talk about how to respond to popular ideas. So from responding to broad ideas to big general ideas as a way to get started in our writing, we then move to the task of how to use specific words, specific quotations from an author. Uh, and we talked about framing and explaining that three part process of introducing the quotation, then providing the words that you're that you're quoting the quotation itself from the authors, and then explaining what it means, how you're using it in your argument. And that three part process was key to framing the quotations as a way to again, follow this process of they say this, and this is what I think it means. So the key idea here, and this is what we're going to be focusing on in this video, is that writing is a conversation. It's a conversation that's carried out on paper or, or online in print, and it's not carried out simultaneously, but it is a conversation. That is, it's a back and forth between one or more speakers, one or more voices. So to enter a conversation as writers, we need to engage with what's being said and then respond to that. And that's the most important part, that we think about writing as a conversation, not just us spouting off randomly, but that we are participating in something with others. So in effective conversation, let's talk briefly about some of the features of effective conversation, at least how they apply to writing. Uh, in this process of engaging and response, responding. Uh, the first is that there's a frame. Right? Just as with quotations, you clearly say, uh, as such and such says, or as such and such argues, and then you, you indicate it. Um, in any conversation, whether you're responding to someone else, whether you're quoting someone else as a way to uh, then build your own ideas, that there's always a frame. There's a clear differentiation between what you're saying and what another person's saying. And so those signal phrases, those templates for introducing quotations according to such and such, such and such argues in the words of such and such, right? All those are there to make sure that we know as your readers or listeners, what's your idea and what's someone else's idea. Whether you're responding to someone else, whether you're quoting someone else's support, 
regardless of the specific relationship between your ideas and the others, whether it's agreement or disagreement, it's first most important that we just know the difference. If you're at a party and you're in a conversation with someone and someone tells a story or expresses their view on a subject and then you just repeat it word for word, that's not really conversation, that's just parroting. So making sure that there's a clear differentiation, a frame, we know what's you and what's someone else. Of course, in any conversation, it's also critical that you listen. If you are talking to someone and not listening to what they are saying, when you respond, you're not gonna, the response isn't gonna make much sense. Or if you're not paying attention or you're thinking about what you wanna think about, you're thinking about your own ideas and not listening to what they say, then you're not gonna be able to accurately represent them. If someone else says, what, was, what were you talking about? You're gonna misrepresent what that other person said. Uh, and of course, in day-to-day -day life, that may not have much of a consequence, but in writing, it's very critical that you listen to who you're responding to. That is, if you're responding to a particular uh, idea or you're quoting someone, you're accurate. You're not misrepresenting what they say. You quote their words exactly as they appear. Or if you're paraphrasing or summarizing their ideas, again, whether you're responding to it, whether you're quoting it, whether you agree or disagree, you're doing so accurately. You're representing what they actually believe and not what you want them to believe. So this also means paying attention to the context. Where are they saying this? How are they saying this? Right? So making sure that you know what the other person says so that you can effectively respond to it with your own ideas. And of course, in any conversation, uh, there has to be connection between the people that are talking. If one person's talking about a certain subject, another person's talking about something totally different, it's not really much of a conversation. So relevance, whether you are responding to someone else your response has to be relevant to what they're saying, has to be related to their ideas, or you at least have to make sure you explain, if it's not clear, you have to explain how your ideas are related. And if you're quoting someone, using someone else's ideas, and again, whether it's agreement, disagreement, whatever, making sure that they're related or you explain how they're related to what it is you're talking about. You don't just throw in a quotation from someone else that has nothing to do with your subject just because they're famous or because it sounds good, but it has to have a connection. So again, understanding ideas in their context. If you're quoting someone else, knowing what do they mean by this in their argument. If you take it out of context, then it may, it may seem relevant, but in fact, not actually be relevant. So always make sure there is a connection. There's a reason why your ideas and these other ideas that you're quoting or responding to are together. There's a reason why you're talking about them in the same place in your paper, and that's the relevance. And finally, and this is of course most important in writing, is that in your response, whether you're responding to a quote or a general idea, a specific author, whatever it is, there's clear explanation of what the relationship is, of how their ideas support or challenge yours, how your ideas support or challenge theirs, making sure that you don't just say something. And again, this is like with quotations, you don't just insert the quotation into your text. You gotta frame it, introduce it, explain it. When you're responding, to someone else, make sure you show how your ideas relate to theirs or and how their ideas relate to yours. So again, this idea of understanding the context and the larger argument that they're making and that you're making is key. So to review the, the keys to entering the written conversation, first is that the purpose is to engage with others. You're engaging with other people here, other ideas, and that's key. No man is an island, no person is an island. Your ideas don't exist independently of others. So engaging with other, idea, other people's ideas only strengthens your thinking and writing in the long run. And so the keys, that framing, they say, I say, we know what you're responding to. We know what the difference is between what you've said and what someone else has said. 
listening, that accurate and fair representation of another person's ideas. And that means both that you put in the effort to understand it, and especially key if you're responding to someone with whom you have a strong disagreement, that you're fair, that you look at things as they see them. You try as, as much as you can to represent their viewpoints as they see them, not as you think of them, or not how you feel about their arguments, especially important when there's difference. That there's relevance, there's connection between the ideas. You're not just quoting someone else for, for fun. That there is a, a reason why you're responding to their ideas or you're quoting them. There's a connection between them. And finally, that in your response, you explain that connection. You say what it is that, that this person, this other idea brings to your argument or how your argument adds to or challenges or changes develops what's been previously said. So those are the keys to entering the written conversation. Now let's look at an exercise. The first thing that I'd like you to do is to read a short article called Keeping the Dream Alive is Your Responsibility and Mine. It's an opinion piece written by uh, a man named Cameron Smith back in 2014. Uh, it may have been updated since then, but uh, this should be the link to the original article. And for those who are in my class, the link is also on Blackboard. So first thing, read this very short article. It shouldn't take you more than a few minutes. So in this exercise, the goal here is that we're looking to see how uh, this other author uses how they engage with other voices as a model, as an example for how we can do it in our own writing. So the first step is that in reading this article, we want to identify any places where the author includes something that they say, some other person or persons that they are uh, quoting or referring to their ideas. Second, after we've identified where the author is using someone else's ideas or engaging with them, we want to identify what the author's attitude is towards those ideas. Do they agree, disagree, are they neutral? What do they think about what they say? And finally, what does this tell us? What does this suggest about how the author's beliefs compare or contrast to the other person's ideas, the other group's ideas, and thus how is the author using these other voices as something, as a way to prompt disagreement, as support, as an example, uh, what is their relationship? So let's pause again for just a moment while you review the article, read it through one more time, and identify those places where the author is using another voice, identify the attitude and jot down some ideas about what you think it suggests about the author's views. So in paragraph one, the author states, in our country, we have all heard about one particular dream. Our parents likely mentioned it. We might have heard about it from a teacher or pastor or a friend. We're expected to know what it means for us. At the same time, most of us have a hard time explaining it. So in this opening paragraph, we see a lot of uh, the author engaging with common views, using patterns very similar to the templates that we've used on how to introduce commonly held ideas. And the author specifically uh, points to our parents, from a teacher or a pastor or a friend. These are the people that we've all heard about it from. And most of us have a hard time explaining it. So we've all heard about it and most of us have a hard time talking about it. The author cites parents, teachers, pastors, friends, suggesting that this is common views held by many, especially 
expressed by authority figures. Notice the author here is using a, a lot of different types of people, a lot of different type, uh, uh, types of authority figures that most people would have had contact with at some point in their life. So suggesting a pretty broad spectrum of people that hold this view. Uh, and again, supporting the idea that this is a commonly held view that most people in the United States have been exposed to. And he, he says that this is something we have all heard. So there seems to be a general agreement about this idea. This is something that's very common um, that most people agree about, right? We've all heard it. Also notice though, after talking about this general agreement that it's something we all uh, have heard and probably implicitly believe or identify with, he says most of us have a hard time explaining it. Even though we know it, even though we say it, even though we talk about the American dream, we don't necessarily, we can't say what it means. We can't explain it. So this suggests that there's ambiguity and confusion about the meaning, even though it's a widely held belief. But what it is that we believe, we maybe aren't quite sure about. So this leads us to the questions, what's the author's attitudes towards these stories or these ideas about the American dream? And what does this first paragraph lead us to expect regarding his writing? He's talking about the American dream. He introduces it as something that we've all heard about, but then also introduces this idea of confusion. What does that tell us about what he's going to be writing about? What might he be writing about? What expectations does it create? And how does it um, foreshadow, in a sense, what his argument's going to be? Well, I would suggest that even though the author seems to have a generally positive attitude towards the concept of the American dream, um, he says it's, he notes it as something common to, to most of us, to many Americans, and he doesn't suggest that it's a, uh, something that we suffer, something that's bad, uh, that we dislike, that we, that we have a positive attitude towards it. But given the idea that we can't explain it, this suggests that the author is going to maybe be critical in some way not to deny the idea of American dream or, or uh, say that we shouldn't believe in some sort of American dream, but to maybe criticize the naivete with which we think about it or to encourage us to be a little bit more thoughtful about what we mean when we talk about the American dream. Let's look at paragraph three. He says it conjures up images of opportunity, bettering ourselves, building community, and maybe even a white picket fence. We hear stories across generations of the dream fulfilled and passed along of parents leaving a better future for their children. So here, notice the, the phrase, we hear stories across generations. That's where he uh, engages very subtly with common views. The they say, across generations, we are told these stories. Our parents, our grandparents, our great-great-grandparents. So again, this suggestion of a common view, opinions expressed by many, reiterates the idea that this is something that comes from our parents or from older generations, from authority figures, and that it's passed down. So it's part of our common heritage as Americans. question again is, what is his attitude towards the American dream? Does he seem to value it? Well, in this paragraph, again, it's, it's very positive description, generally speaking. Um, he's talking about things that we value, things that people want, things that, that at least some people want and would make them happy, their goals in life. Um, and that it's something that, again, is part of our common heritage passed down from generation to generation. So uh, he's not explicitly negative about it, but does that mean that he values it? I would suggest, again, given the way the, the author keeps saying, we hear this, we've all heard this, we've all been told that, stressing that this is a common story that many of us get. Um, I think that suggests, if not outright doubt or skepticism, at least a sense that, well, we've heard this, but it's not quite as simple as we've heard. So building up this sense that, well, yes, the American dream is something we value, something that we all want, something that we promote, but Maybe, again, we should be think a little bit more seriously about what it is um, and why we want it and how to actually achieve it rather than just parroting the dream itself. 
let's move on to paragraph four. So here we get a change in tone and a change in the kinds of ideas that the speaker is engaging with. Lately, many of our leaders have suggested that the American dream is fading, that without the right policy solutions or political characters, we will lose what has made us great. Without their significant changes, they contend that we will make uh, that we will wake up from the American dream and realize it was nothing more than wishful thinking based on the past success of others. So here we have uh, twice the author now very specifically uh, identifying many of our leaders they contend. So the ideas that he expresses here are not the common ideas that we get from our parents and grandparents, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they come from a smaller group, our leaders. Uh, which probably means our po politicians, political leaders, maybe other public figures, but probably politicians is the most likely group. Uh, and so this is now what they say about the American dream. And notice that their attitude, or at least what they say about the American dream, is very different than what has been said before. So yeah, many of our leaders, politicians, other important figures, and what are they doing? They're raising doubts, they're raising problems, they're making an argument about the American dream, encouraging certain action on our part. So the question is, does Smith agree? Does he agree with their assessment that the American dream is in trouble, that the American dream is uh, in danger, that it's going to disappear? And perhaps more importantly, does he agree with their idea that, well, okay, it, it, that we need to follow a certain politician's policy, that it's in the hands of the politicians and it's our duty to follow them, to support a certain politician in, or group of politicians in promoting their policies to, uh, uh, to save the American dream. What does Smith think about that? So again, the, the questions that we're looking at, how do the politicians view the American dream? Well, they view it as something in danger. How does that compare with the stories we have all heard? Uh, it, it challenges those stories to some extent, or it puts them in danger. It threatens the beliefs that we've, been, uh, that we've inherited. And can we tell what the speaker's attitudes towards the politicians is? Well, um, I think again, the lately we've heard a lot, there suggests to be a little bit of skepticism on his part, a little bit of doubt. Perhaps not about the idea that the American dream needs to be defended, but the suggestion that these individual politicians are the ones that have the answers. He does suggest perhaps, I think, a little bit of, of uh, a skepticism on that idea at the very least. Let's move on to paragraph five. Before he became president, then Senator Barack Obama correctly identified where we are as a nation. So very clear now, perhaps the most specific uh, identification of a they. We've got across generations, parents, teachers, pastors, certain leaders, and now a specific person, then Senator Barack Obama. Um, and the author says here, he correctly identified where we are as a nation. So that tells us that this is something that the author agrees with. He thinks it's correct. Right. He agrees with o o Obama's take on the American dream. He agrees with Obama on our status. And that's why he provides uh, his most most in-depth quotation from this specific person. Right. When he's talking about general they, he doesn't give specific specific quotations because, of course, you can't quote what they say in general, what most people say. He also doesn't quote the politicians because he's talking about a group of them, but now that he's talking about an individual and one that he agrees with, he's gonna quote him directly. And so our question is, does Obama agree with the politicians from the previous paragraph? If he agrees with Obama, then what is it? What is Obama's attitude? And that will tell us what his attitude is. And here's what the quotation from Obama. So we have Smith quoting Obama. This is a quotation from a quotation. Uh, you hear a lot about the divisions in our country, about how we're becoming more separated by geography and ideology, race and religion, wealth and opportunity. And we've had plenty of politicians who try to take advantage of these divisions, pitting Americans against one another or targeting different messages to different audiences. 
So in Obama's quote, he is doing a they say, I say in within this quotation. Obama says, you hear? Uh, he said, we've had plenty of politicians. So he identifies the specific they say. He identifies a they that is talking to us and what they're saying about um, divisions in our country. So we have this multiple level of they said. Smith quotes Obama. Obama refers to what others have said. So it's I say that Obama said that they said, right? So it's a little kind of multiple layers here. Uh, but again, Smith is quoting Obama because he agrees with him. So he agrees with Obama's assessment of these other politicians. Obama says, you hear. He doesn't specify, so again, it suggests a common view expressed by many. You hear a lot about the divisions in our country. And given his what he's saying, and you hear a lot about this, we often hear that, that suggests that he has a contrasting view, that he's going to differ in his approach, in his view about our country, where we are, the divisions, etc. And he says politicians try to take advantage. So when accusing politicians of trying to take advantage, trying to create, exaggerate divisions, that says that Obama disagrees with this tactic. You don't call it taking advantage, usually. Um, that's, that's usually a negative, has a negative connotation. So it says, says to us that Obama disagrees with the tactic of, of creating divisions, which means that the author probably disagrees with the tactic of creating divisions as well. So we might ask ourselves just to make sure that we're connecting all these ideas. Do these politicians have anything in common with the politicians mentioned in paragraph four? Yeah, these sound like the same kind of politicians. The politicians who are talking about how the American dream is in danger and it will disappear if you don't vote for me and my policies. Sounds a lot like the politicians who are saying there's all these divisions in our country and these people are against us and so you need to side with me if you want to be a real American. So it sounds like these are the same kinds of people, and that helps us understand what the author's attitude is. He disagrees with the idea, maybe not the idea that, that the American dream needs protection, but he does disagree with the idea of division and of saying, well, if you vote for them, the American dream is going to die. But if you vote for me, I'm going to make sure the American dream survives. Cameron Smith, the author of the article, agrees with Obama, um, agrees with the statement uh, uh, that he quotes from Obama that these divisions are a bad thing, that they're taking advantage, and that they don't help to really protect the American dream. And uh, paragraph seven, uh, Smith writes, although he was referring to his political predecessors, many Americans still agree with that statement seven years later. So many Americans still agree. Now here the uh, the author is is referring back to a large group, a large they. Many of us still agree with this idea that Obama said about um, rejecting divisions. That phrasing, many Americans still agree, tells us this is a consensus, a common view. Most people, or at least many people, agree with what Obama said. And since Smith agrees with Obama's statement, it seems likely that, that he agrees with this general view, this rejection of the idea of division, the rejection that, well, to protect the American dream, we have to vote for one person and not another person. We have to side with one party versus another party. The idea that that is going to protect the American dream, Obama rejects, Many Americans reject and Smith rejects. So we can ask, what does this tell us about the author's purpose, his main idea? Uh, what is he proposing in this article? And we're not, we haven't gone through the whole thing. I won't go through the whole thing in this, in this video, but we can start to tell based on the title, based on what we've read, we can start to predict what we think his idea is. It is about the American dream. It is about predict, uh, protecting the American dream and the dangers that it faces. And he does think that we need to be, I think, realistic about those dangers. But he also rejects certain positions, rejects the idea of division, rejects the politicization of the American dream, using it to take advantage of divisions or even to create divisions. So we can get a sense already of what the author's purpose is and what his main idea is, even if he hasn't said, my thesis is XYZ. To review, we can trace 
how the author has developed his ideas through others' voices and how at each stage he's used other ideas, the ideas from others, uh, as a way to express his own as the starting point, the launch pad. We have all heard. So he introduces the topic as a commonly held view. This includes the author. And, but he also suggests that there's confusion. What does it all mean? What does this idea that we all believe, what does it really mean? Many of our leaders have suggested, so it introduces the views of a specific group, which are familiar to most, and they cast doubt on what we have all heard. And they give us one possible solution, follow us. But what's the author's attitude? Is this true? If he's asking, well, what, is the, what does the American dream wall mean? This is one response to his question given by many of our leaders. And, but is it the, the answer that he wants or does he believe in their answer? So then we get the specific Barack Obama, direct quotation, a specific person. It challenges the solution from our leaders. And the author indicates that it's correct. He says Obama correctly identified it. So the author agrees and then many Americans still agree. So back to the idea of consensus, common view, many Americans still agree with what uh, Barack Obama said about rejecting divisions, and the author agrees with that as well. We can even sort of plot it on a spectrum from general to specific, right? Starts with most Americans, that's a very general group, that's the biggest group, then many politicians, that's a much more specific group, uh, it's a much smaller subset of Americans, but it's still um, not an individual person. Then to a very specific, an individual, Barack Obama, that's his third uh, uh, voice that he engages with. And then back out to many Americans, not quite to most Americans yet. Uh, he doesn't say most people agree with Obama, but he does say many. So it could be a large minority or it could be the majority. Um, so it's again, so he's moving from general to specific and back out to general as a way to develop his ideas. Now, we're not going to go through the rest of the article together uh, in this video, but you can do so on your own and ask these, these questions, which are the same questions that you would ask anytime you're reading something, anytime you're trying to understand how an author is using the ideas of others to uh, uh, support their own as a prompt, as a starting point, as a launching pad for their own ideas. What are the other voices or figures that the author identifies in the article? How does the author signal agreement or disagreement? Is it explicit? I agree, I disagree. Or is it more subtle through the way it's framed? Well, we've all heard a lot about this. A number of, of people claim this. Is it more subtle like that to suggest agreement or disagreement? And finally, how does the author use those ideas, the ideas of others, as a way to develop what he or she wants to say? Uh, how do they use them as a launching pad, as a way to prompt their own ideas and give support and justification to what they're trying to argue. Again, these are the questions that you can ask of this article and of anything that you're right that you're reading, the where an author is is using the words of others, is quoting or responding to other writers. Now, for those who are in my class and who are watching this for class, uh, the next step, you'll need to download the sample articles 
file from Blackboard that has a number of short articles like Cameron Smith's um, and uh, skim through those and select one that you'd like to read uh, and that you'll use as uh, for the exercise. What you'll be doing is basically the same thing that we were doing here, uh, but you'll be doing it on your own and, and typing it up and submitting it to Blackboard. You're going to be identifying the different voices and how the author uses them. So the three things that you're going to be looking at in each in, in the article that you respond to, you need to identify where the author includes something that they say, the uh, some other person or persons, whether it's a specific individual or a general group. Uh, identify what the author's attitude is towards what they say. Do they agree? Do they disagree? Or is it some other some combination of that? And what does this suggest about how the author's beliefs compare or contrast to theirs? Um, what does it suggest about what their overall argument is about this topic? So the same process that we were doing in this exercise in this video. And so again, for those in class, you'll submit your responses to the identifying others voices exercises uh, exercise to Blackboard by the due date that's indicated there. And I will also uh, indicate that to you in email. And there's an example of how to format your responses also included on Blackboard. So you'll be picking one of the articles, again, going through this process, identifying where the, uh, the author is engaging with someone else and how they're using those ideas, and then um, typing that up, uploading it to Blackboard. If you have any questions, my email, ryan.paul at tamug.edu. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about this material or about the assignment. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next video.